Thank you so much. It's been a long journey. If you can believe it or not, I started preaching on the book of Matthew in December of 2020. No, not 2021, 2020. I preached through the book of Matthew all the way through, uh, through 2021 and even into this year, and I, we finally arrived at Matthew chapter 28. And Matthew 28 is the story of Easter, so I saved it for this morning. And I want you to read with me from your Bibles in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 20, as our text for this morning Easter message. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the to went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angels said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. Then came to him, or sorry, they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole, away, uh, stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers did, or so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circum circulated among the Jews to this very day. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. May God bless this reading of his holy word. Sometimes Easter can become passe. We have so done it so often that we say, what's so great about Easter? We forget. We become callous. 
And sometimes we can read a book, a, a, a text of scripture, like Matthew chapter 28, and we can say, what's so great about Matthew 28? And I want to tell you this morning that I have discovered five events that are great uh, from Matthew chapter 28. And I want to have us look at them together. The first event that is spectacular, that is great, is found in the first four verses. An angel caused a great earthquake. Californians know a little bit about earthquakes. We know what it's like. One time I was sitting in my uh, living room at home, and all of a sudden I felt like I was on a roller coaster. And then I said, Miriam, did you feel that? Well, she was in the girls' room, and she said, no, I didn't. Oh, I just felt it. <laughs> and we know what it's like to feel an earthquake here in California. Well, they felt an earthquake that day. In fact, Matthew records two earthquakes. The first earthquake he recorded in chapter 27, verse 51 and 52, when Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake. The earth shook. But then again in chapter 28, verse 2, we have a second earthquake. And it took place at dawn on the first day of the week. And it happened while the women were on their way to, to the tomb. Why did it happen? Well, Matthew says there was angelic activity. Look at verse 2. The angel's activity was dynamic. He came down from heaven. He came towards the tomb. And he rolled the stone away from the tomb and sat on it. Now, this stone was not just a little pebble. This stone was a massive stone to cover the entrance to the tomb, probably about as tall as a man is tall, and it was wide that way as well. And it had been kind of on an incline, and they had let it fall down in front of the cave, and now you had to get it away. You had to have extra power to get it back up that incline because it's kind of on a rut. And the ladies were scared. Who is going to roll the stone away? They said to each other. And when they got there, they found out that the stone had already been rolled away because an angel had done the work. The angel had come down from heaven. But not only was the angel's activity dynamic, the angel's appearance was brilliant. Look at verse 3. It was as bright as the lightning. Have you ever watched fireworks on July 4th and enjoyed how it gets bright, the sky gets bright with the fireworks? But it doesn't happen here in California very often. But I remember in Canada when there was a lightning storm. And sometimes, like in Canada, our fireworks are on July 1st and not July 4th because that's Canada Day. But anyways, we would have we would have the fireworks, and then a lightning storm would happen either during or after the fireworks, and the lightning was always brighter than the fireworks. And it was just brilliant. That's how brilliant the angels' clothing were. They was as bright as lightning, and its clothes were as white as snow. This was an astonishing sight. And then the angel's effect was terrifying, verse 4. The guards were afraid. Wait a minute, do you realize who these guys are? These are hardy. These guys are trained for any situation. These guys are Roman guards. And the guards were afraid. They didn't know how to uh, face this situation. And they shook and they became like dead men. Dead men don't stand up. These guys fell to the floor, well, the ground. This was an amazing sight. Because of this great earthquake, God decided to do something unique. 
to start Easter Sunday. Not only was there a great earthquake, there, were, there was also a great announcement. The angel gave a great announcement. Look at verses 5 to 7. It was a comforting announcement. Do not be afraid. Anybody here know what it's like to be afraid? Maybe you're afraid for your family. Maybe you're afraid for your finances. Maybe you're afraid for your health. Whatever it is, God has a way of coming to us and saying to us, you do not need to be afraid. God has conquered sin and death and hell forever. You do not need to be afraid. The angel said, do not be afraid. I know what you're looking for. What were the women looking for? They were looking for the body of the Lord Jesus. They were there on Friday. They saw the body being taken into the tomb. So they came on Sunday because they were expecting to anoint that body. They, they assumed that that body would be there because dead people don't get up and walk, you know. But, but the angel says to the ladies, I know what you're looking for, who you're looking for. And then there was a, not only a comforting announcement, but a joyous announcement. He is not here. I heard about a preacher who went to Israel. And he went to Israel to see the sites of where Jesus was crucified and where Jesus was laid in a tomb. And he was so excited about going to Israel and seeing the sites. But when he went to, to the garden tomb, he said, I didn't feel anything. He said, I might as well have been at home eating breakfast. I just didn't feel anything. And he said, they let us go into the tomb. And we walked into the tomb. He said, I still don't feel anything. He said, I, I feel like I should be feeling something now. This is an important thing I'm doing. He says, I'm not feeling anything at all. What's wrong with me? And then he turned around to leave, leave the tomb. And he looked at his wife. And he saw this sign on top of the entrance to the tomb. He looks at his wife and he says, did you see that? And he said, the sign simply said, he is not here. He said, that's why I didn't feel anything. I don't come to a mausoleum to see my savior. I serve a risen Savior. He lives in the highest heaven, and he lives in the humble heart. He is not here. That's the message of Easter Sunday. He's not in the grave. He is risen, just as he said. And it was an instructive announcement. Not only was Jesus alive, but they were invited to come and see. The Bible is not scared of honest investigation. Do you want to know the truth? Come and see. It's true. There's nothing we're hiding. It's not a secret. It's not a deception. It's obvious. It's open for everyone to see. Jesus was here, but he is not here. He is alive. Come and see the place where he lay. But after you come and see, there's a reversal. Do you notice the reversal? Come and see where he lay, but then he says the next sentence, go and tell his disciples. After you come and investigate, after you have your heart assured that Jesus is alive, don't be satisfied with that. After you know that Jesus is alive, go and tell somebody about it. 
This is news that is too good to keep to yourself. He is risen from the dead, and he's gone ahead of you into Galilee. Galilee. That's interesting. We've heard about Galilee before in our study of Matthew. Do you know what Galilee was? Galilee was the place where Jesus made his headquarters. Galilee was the place where Jesus did most of his ministry. He had gone to Judea, to Jerusalem, to go into the temple. He had gone to Jerusalem to be accused and, and murdered. But now that he was risen from the dead, it's back to work, boys. Go back to Galilee. Go back to the place of ministry. Go back to the place where I called you. Go back to work because Jesus is alive and he's giving you work to do to tell people that he is alive. Go back to Galilee. So I tell you there was a great earthquake. There was a great announcement. But then in verses 8 to 10, I see that the risen king made a great announcement. The women were of mixed emotions. They were afraid and yet filled with joy. You know how you can have mixed feelings sometimes? I'm told, I, I've never been a grandparent yet, but I'm told that grandparents have a very joyous feeling when they see the headlights of the, their children's car coming into their driveway. But I hear they can also have a joyous feeling when they see the taillights. You know how you can have mixed feelings? Well, these ladies have mixed feelings. They were afraid. They couldn't believe what they had just heard but they were filled with joy. Could it be true? Is it really true that Jesus has risen from the dead? If it's true, it changes life forever. But it's true. They were afraid yet filled with joy and they ran to tell the disciples. And as they're going to tell the disciples, something amazing happens. Jesus shows up. I mean the once dead, risen Lord Jesus. Jesus shows up and he greeted them. Hey, everybody. Howdy. Greetings. And the women were so delighted to see him again that they clasped his feet and worshiped him. Do you know what it means to worship? We, we tend to, in North America, think that worship means singing. And there is, we can worship through singing, but I want you to understand the deeper meaning of the word worship. To worship is to bow down. To say, I am nothing and he is everything. That's what worship means in the Bible. So these ladies bowed down and clasped his feet. Why? Because they were worshiping him. He deserved their worship. And listen, there are many times in the book of Revelation where somebody tried to worship an angel, and the angel said, Stop! Do not worship me. I am not worthy of worship. But when somebody bowed down to worship the risen Lord Jesus, he didn't tell them to stop because the Lord Jesus is the only one who is worthy of all of our worship. So they bowed down. They clasped his feet and they worshiped him. Look at verse 10. Jesus spoke to them and he comforted them again. Notice what he says. We've heard this before, but this time it's from the, not from an angel. This time it's from Jesus himself. Do not be afraid. Somebody needs to hear that message this morning. Do not be afraid. 
Then he instructed them, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There's that message again. Go back to the place of work. Go back to the place of ministry. Go to Galilee, and that's where I'm going to meet you. So we've seen so far that there was a great earthquake, a great announcement, and a great appearance. But that's not all. The Jewish elders, number four, promoted a great deception. Do you know that many secular magazines like to make a big splash on Easter weekend? I don't know if they've done it this year, but Time Magazine and all those other magazines, National Geographic, all those guys, like to make a big splash on Easter weekend. And very often, they will interview liberal scholars who say that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, that all of this is a Christian mythology. Don't believe what the magazines tell you at this time of year. Go to the book that tells you the truth, the Bible, the Word of God. I want you to notice that there was a great deception from the very first. The people who, who staged this great deception were the Jewish elders. And it's so ironic because if you just read back about a chapter, the Jewish elders tried to prevent deception. You know what they were doing? They said this man named Jesus predicted that he would rise on the third day. And the disciples would likely go and steal his body to make it look like his prediction came true. Therefore, we're going to go to Pilate and we're going to ask him to put a guard by the tomb to make sure nobody steals the body. And they put a guard by the tomb for three days just to make sure. They were so nervous about deception, but when Jesus actually rose from the dead, they were the ones who created a great deception. The guards come back and they said, you won't believe it. <coughs> Jesus actually did rise from the dead. You won't believe it. We were terrified and fell like dead men. You won't believe it. Jesus is alive and the tomb is empty. What do we do now, Pilate? And the Jewish leaders were with it. They said, ah, we're going to pay you some extra money. And you know what we're going to pay you some extra money? We're going to pay you some extra money to tell people that you fell asleep and that while you were asleep, the disciples came and they stole the body. There's a problem with that statement. If they fell asleep, Pilate would have their heads because they were employed to stay awake and guard the tomb. And the chief priest says, we'll take care of Pilate. We'll, we'll take care of that trouble. You don't worry, but you just tell, tell this story. So there is a deception from the religious leaders to keep the story of Jesus down. You tell them that somebody stole the body. There's another problem with this story. You know what the problem is? The Christian faith could have been stopped instantaneously. All they would have had to do was produce the body of a dead Jesus. If anybody could have produced the body of a dead Jesus, Christianity would have died right there. Never heard about it again. But they couldn't produce a body because the body had risen from the dead and it wasn't where it was. So there was a great deception. 
The guards reported everything. The elders devised a plan, a large sum of money. The disciples were, or the, the soldiers were supposed to say, the disciples came and stole away the body while, while we were sleeping, and they were offered to keep the soldiers out of trouble. And the soldiers accepted the bribe, verse seven or 15, and they spread the story widely, and it's even made it to Time magazine in the 20th century. So I said we had great things. There's one more great thing. The risen king gave a great commission, verses 16 to 20. The disciples obeyed Jesus. They went to Galilee. They went back to the mountain where Jesus had sent them from. And the disciples worshipped Jesus there. And then it says, but some doubted. You know what? That's a kind reference to Thomas. And then the disciples were commissioned by Jesus. Jesus offered them his power. He has all power in heaven and on earth. And you know how Jesus proved that he has all power in heaven and on earth? He proved it by rising from the dead. Listen to me closely. I have heard too many sermons on the Great Commission that were divorced from the resurrection. The resurrection is the story for the Great Commission. The resurrection is intimately linked with the Great Commission. If it's not for the resurrection, you don't have any reason to go and tell. It's the same part of Scripture. It's the same message. Jesus is alive. Go and tell. So we get to Jesus offered them his power. He has all power in heaven and on earth. Jesus offered them his plan. As you are going, make disciples of all nations. That little word that we translate in our text, go, it's actually our participle, which means as you are going. You know what that means for us now? That means as you are going to school this week, as you are going to work this week, as you are going about your daily tasks this week, what is your job? Make disciples. Make followers of Jesus. You don't make followers of Jesus inside the gathering. You make followers of Jesus when you're scattered. And when you are scattered, you make disciples and you bring them with you to the gathering to worship Jesus. And then you scatter to make more disciples and then you bring them back to worship Jesus together. And that's the constant way that a church grows. As you are going, make disciples. How do you make disciples? You make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do you make disciples? By teaching them to observe all things. Getting baptized is the first step, but the rest of your life you are being taught to observe all things that God has commanded you. And if you have not carefully studied the whole New Testament, you are not able to observe all that God has commanded you. And that is why we invite you to come to church so that you will be carefully taught the whole New Testament. And if you are carefully taught the whole New Testament, then you can obey it and you can observe it in your daily life. You desperately need worship service, you desperately need a small group Bible study, and you desperately need a personal Bible study, or else you will never fulfill the Great Commission. The Great Commission is to baptize them and teach them everything that I have commanded you. And that's our job. 
And then he says, he offers them a promise. The last part of verse 20. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I don't know when this age is going to end. By the way, I know when the service is going to end, but I don't know when this age is going to end. Jesus is going to come back sometime. But until then, we have to be faithful in obeying the Lord Jesus in what he told us to do. We need to be faithful in making disciples. We need to be faithful in making followers of the Lord Jesus. We need to be faithful in baptizing them. We need to be faithful in teaching them to observe everything that he has commanded because he is with us in this work forever until the end of the age. And then he will come back and we will be with him forever. So what's so great about Easter? What's so great about Matthew 28? The angel caused a great earthquake. The angel gave a great announcement. The risen Lord gave a great appearance. The Jewish elders promoted a great deception. And the risen Lord gave a great commission. That's what's so great about Matthew 28. Jesus is alive. And Jesus being alive changes the way we live, the way we operate. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we serve a risen Savior, that you are the risen King, that you have conquered death, hell, and the grave forever. And we want to be your obedient servants and do what you told us to do by taking this good news around the world, even around our street. In Jesus' name, amen.